Our next speaker is Richard Kahn, and Richard's a grain grower and sheep producer at The Rock, but he's also the current chairman of Southern Ag Grain, which is a, dis a different example of uh, post-farm gate business because it's got about 250 predominantly farmer shareholders. And so without further ado, I'm going to ask Richard to come up and uh, speak about um, Southern Ag Grain and uh, the challenges and opportunities that it's provided. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was a little daunted about uh, yeah, the calibre of speakers today, and I'm actually filling in. I, I'm normally not uh, in the business of giving PowerPoint presentations, but I was reassured uh, one of the earlier speakers said they had a three-week um, stint at university. I uh, started to study agricultural economics at Sydney Uni. Uh, two years into a four-year degree, I left with a chequered academic uh, record, uh, fond memories, no qualifications and a hex debt. So, um, <laughs> I, uh, but opportunities sort of fell out of that. I, I came back to Wagga and there was a company called Riverina Wool came in uh, processing and wool out the road here and I did nine months uh, there and then went up to Moree and worked near irrigated cotton and uh, eventually found my way back to a mixed farm locally here. Uh, it was at a time when uh, the experience of Moree helped me in that uh, in mixed farms we were starting to get a little more intensive, uh, higher inputs and uh, and certainly improving particularly in agronomy and I think the, the experience in cotton certainly helped me with that. Um, Southern Ag Venture. Um, Southern Ag Venture is an unlisted public company and we've got uh, just over 250 um, pretty well farmer shareholders. It began a, sort of over a barbecue in 2006. A um, couple of uh, local Lockhart farmers had just completed Nuffield scholarships and travelled the world and seen what opportunities were out there. And uh, 2005, we had probably our, um, our one, one of our biggest production years ever in this region, but uh, commodity prices were quite low. Over the conversation, they thought, well, rather than complain about it, maybe we should do something about it. And uh, out of that was born the uh, Lockhart Biofuels Group. You might remember back then biofuels were the, the, the flavour of the month and uh, you know uh, the, the committee started suggest, um, investigating uh, um, processing canola seed into uh, biofuel. Fairly quickly um, discovered that it wasn't going to work and it, the crux of it was that um, you, you had a high value um, food product like canola and you were going to turn it into fuel and uh, you just couldn't, couldn't compete in that, that space. So after investigation of a number of um, uh, you know, potential projects, and it's amazing as an individual farmer, you know, hadn't spoken to anyone you know, about value adding or, or certainly the local grain corp uh, person had, didn't want to come and talk to us about uh, different projects. As soon as we formed the group, people were you know, falling out of the woodwork, uh, snake oil salesmen to to uh, the majors like uh, Grain Corp wanting to come back and re-engage with us. Um, but after investigation, we uh, we decided to pursue a, a joint venture grain accumulation business with the Emerald Group. And the main reason we went down that path, they had the model, and I likened it to a Bendigo Bank model. They had a similar joint venture grain business in Victoria, SQP, and, uh, you know, they were prepared to put some money in and, and um, um, work with us on, on this project. Um, October to December 2009, the prospectus was launched. It's interesting, uh, uh, as a steering committee, uh, we had someone come and speak to us about um, uh, launching our prospectus and it was suggested that we uh, you know, need to aim for uh, some diversity in our shareholding and we ended up with uh, farmers, retired farmers, uh, farmers self-managed superannuation funds uh, one transport operator, a machinery dealer, and a stockbroker. It sort of made up our 250 shareholders. Uh, November 2009, we then, uh, uh, our prospectus was still uh, running, but we um, wanted to uh, be up and running for the 2009 harvest. So we launched uh, Southern Ag Grain, which is a 50-50 joint venture with the Emerald Group. 
commenced operations in Wagga with uh, staff of one, a grains manager, and um, by December 2009 we had a staff of three. Uh, today, Southern Ag Grain has a staff of seven and buys on behalf of Emerald around 500,000 tonnes of grain per annum. Um, so Southern Ag Venture, we, our first um, joint venture was with the Emerald Group, but we've, um, we've also uh, interested in other commercial relationships and joint ventures. Uh, we haven't, it's a difficult road, and um, we haven't, um, uh, none of the other um, um, potential uh, opportunities we've pursued have, have um, come to fruition, but uh, we've had a few little things like um, um, uh, there was a solar group buying um, sort of deal we did. Uh, we have operated a uh, storage facility at Ungary. There was a need, there was a group of growers um, were struggling to, to find homes for their wheat and barley, so we uh, leased a site up there and, and gave them an option for a number of years. Um, the 50-50 uh, the uh, joint venture is, um, it's a standalone company, Southern Ag Grain. Uh, the board of Southern Ag Grain is made up of um, three Emerald direct Directors and three um, Southern Ag Venture Directors, and, and it functions in itself. Um, Southern Ag Grain is really a distribution business for Emerald. So Emerald are the principles of the grain uh, and, and Southern Ag Grain effectively gets a fee for uh, distributing those um, um, products throughout um, southern New South Wales. In uh, The original owners of Emerald were, were pretty well three grain traders that worked for various companies and put their heads together and formed Emerald and it was largely, largely a pooling business. Um, very quickly they got up to three million tonnes of, um, of grain that they were buying, accumulating. Um, the Sumitomo Corporation actually bought a 50% stake in Emerald in 2010 uh, and, and that was quite exciting for us because we'd, we'd ended up in really a, a joint venture uh, that was a just a grain accumulation business but we're really trying to get in touch with our, our, our customers further down the, the chain and uh, it's interesting talking to the Japanese. The Japanese actually said to us that they one of the reasons they bought Emerald was the connection to farmers and they wanted to get closer to farmers. Out of all that, it's, it's been, uh, despite the connection, it, it's, it, it has been difficult to um, extract, I think, additional value that we can quantify out of, out of that relationship, and I'll talk more, more about that uh, later on. The other key point is um, Southern Ag Grain operates independently of, of, of our, our farmer-owned company. Uh, probably only about 25% of um, the grain accumulated by Southern Ag Grain comes from shareholders, and, and it varies from 90 to 50% of shareholders would sell grain to Southern Ag Grain. So it's very much market driven and, and the key is you, you can't be all things to all people. There are times when you don't want to buy grain, it doesn't make sense, there are locations that just don't make sense. So um, at the end of the day if we do some soil searching I think what we probably bought to the, to the area is another competitor that may or may not have um, operated in, in southern New South Wales. Well, that didn't work out. Oh, here we go. I borrowed this slide from Andrew Buffler. When we launched uh, Southern Ag Grain, he, um, he put it up at a presentation fresh off a Nuffield uh, scholarship um, who's in London. And this, um, you know, back. The, the top line is retail food prices and the bottom line is farmers' terms of trade. And I believe the period is 100, 100, over the last 100 years. And in the middle we've got supply chain cost and middleman profit. Um, this was the space we wanted to get involved with. Um, I don't know, certainly in the space we operate in, I don't think there are huge middleman profits. I think it's probably further down the chain. I think we've, we've probably made some gains in supply chain costs, but we'll talk, I'll talk about that shortly. Changes in the Australian grain industry. Pretty hard to keep pace of. Um, if I'd said to a group of farmers pre-deregulation that Cargill would own AWB, I'd be laughed out of the room. 
So the rate of change has been fairly, fairly fast. Post deregulation, there are over 50 export licences granted. Um, we're now sort of seeing a period of consolidation, particularly in bulk grain exports. So I sort of agree, I think David mentioned we're in a, a, a we're trading a bulk commodity, but I think there's probably a bulk commodity and then there's a, a domestic um, a chain. And uh, I think we're fast coming to the, the situation where a farmer won't go to the local silo and choose between a, uh, you know, a list of buyers. He'll be choosing a supply chain. And um, the, um, all the, uh, all the uh, major bulk wheat exporters are moving to a fully integrated supply chain. So they'll own the trading arm, uh, upcountry storage, rail, in the port. And this has been born out of logistics problems post single desk. And one of the things that IWB probably did quite well, uh, I don't know that it was necessarily the least cost, was coordinated the logistics um, uh, of exporting the Australian grain crop. Post um, single desk, a lot of the players didn't have access to rail. Uh, we had shipping issues, uh, ships failing survey. I don't know that you're aware, uh, um, Aquis don't inspect a ship till it's actually uh, docked at the port. Um, a, port uh, a port like uh, Port Melbourne, Emeralds Port, holds 50,000 tonnes and a Panamax vessel is, holds 55. So if your ship's alongside and it fails survey, it's got to go off and be clean. You've got 50,000 tonnes of grain sitting there, more booked in to feed the, and it just creates a whole lot of problems. The other issue, on the flip side, there were ships, uh, companies facing demarrage because the ship would dock and they just physically couldn't get the grain in because they were relying on road, didn't have access to rail. These problems are being addressed now and um, that's why I can cer certainly speak for Emerald but Grain Corp have the capacity, AWB uh, to date, all bar the port, but uh, they're now part of the consortium that's uh, building the new port, Port Kemble. So I think now, particularly in the uh, bulk wheat, export um, space, we're, we're seeing a period of con con consolidation um, and there'll be uh, the major players, it'll be an integrated supply chain and it'll be the haves and the have-nots. So Southern New South Wales, Emerald have got supply chain all the way through, Grain Corp do, AWB will to Oh, righto. Oh. And uh, but, but then a farmer might be choosing between an alternative uh, domestic supply chain. And uh, if you look um, you know, close to us, there's a million tonnes of demand just in the Golden Valley, mostly going into dairy cows. Opportunities. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but the growing middle class in emerging economies, China is an example, 300 million middle class people at the moment defined 10 to 60,000 US dollars a year in income or a third of their income available for discretionary spending, which is the exciting part. I think the, the, the demand for uh, quantity and high quality food and particularly protein, you know, should be quite high. Um, I think we'll end up in, it, it we'll have high value domestic and export markets and um, the, uh, we, we'll also see the multiply effect of, a, of some strong commodity markets if we look at dairy. I mean, um, that, that demand in the Golden Valley, I mean, there's a demand, obviously, for grain from this uh, region. Uh, ability to um, leverage our high quality standards. Um, certainly the Japanese tell, tell, um, are telling us that, uh, you know, the quality of our product's quite high. The ability to leverage our logistics capacity. Now that we've fixed some of the problems, I think the fact that we can uh, go to a customer and say, you know, we have the ability to hit the market with a quality product, uh, that, that's stored correctly uh, is an advantage. Challenges, um, none of these things are insurmountable, but extracting additional value out of the supply chain and back to the farm gate. It's always a challenge. It's from where it's uh, consumers are demanding high quality clean green food, but the majority are also demanding cheap food. Uh, competitors, particularly those with the lower cost of production, such as or execution costs, such as the Black Sea. Cost of processing in Australia, 
river and a wool combing uh, an example, it's actually uh, completely shut up and uh, all the processing is done offshore. Counterparty risk. I couldn't fit on that slide the number of grain trading organisations that have gone broke in the last. And it's a domino effect. Uh, container packer uh, uh, falls over in Melbourne. Uh, uh, due to the arbitrage of, of grain, uh, you know, it affects a whole lot of other companies. So it's, it's certainly an issue. Summary. There are many opportunities out there. It takes time and diligence in many cases, considerable capital to take advantage of it. Many organisations want a connection with farmers, few want to pay for the opportunity. Consumers d demand high quality, safe, convenient food but are also price sensitive. Companies will generally flavour least cost execution when sourcing com commodities and sometimes that's us, particularly into Asia. Um, in the case of grain, cheap quality product is often blended with a high quality product to meet a standard. Uh, that's, an issue, uh, that, that's an opportunity for us and I think if, if we can maintain quality standards um, we want to be um, I guess one of those phone calls that people make. If you've got to blend up a, a, a blend to meet a um, certain standard for a customer, if black sea wheat's trading $100 below Australian wheat, <coughs> they're going to source black sea wheat. But if they need to blend it, I think there's opportunity as a commodity to, uh, to, to, to be that commodity of choice to, to improve the quality of a blend. And I think the real opportunity there. In terms of, we, we had visions of uh, branding product and, and putting parcel product together. Farmers are very independent in the nature. And it can be problematic when attempting to put together parcel of a commodity. The, uh, the other issue I have, if um, you're developing a market and we have a situation like a drought and domestic basis blows out and you can't blame a farmer, they'll, they'll certainly uh, follow a different supply chain and you could be um, you know, left without any product to supply your customer. Australia is well positioned to benefit from trade with emerging economies again, but extracting additional value back to the farm gate is a challenge. And, and who, um, I, I think our experience is that, that, that perhaps it's, it's not a, um, an overall premium for a product, but it might be access to a market. So, you know, with a product of choice, we're probably not going to necessarily... Um, particularly in a bulk commodity like wheat, uh, demand any more for it, but, but will be one of those um, countries, I guess, that people want to talk to and they'll know they'll get a, a clean quality product and, and it can be delivered uh, on time and we're generally fairly politically stable, so, you know, no hiccups along the way. So I think that's probably our opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. Uh very much, uh, Richard. That was really good. A different example. Um, um, we will have a little uh, space at the end in, with the permission of uh, uh, Deirdre or Lucinda, whoever it is, um, for a question to each of those speakers. But we're going to move on to our third speaker in this session now, John Brady. Um, John Brady is the CEO of uh, Kogome Australia. Um, a wholly owned affiliate of the uh, Japanese uh, company uh, Kagome Group, a $2.3 billion public company uh, quoted on the Nikkei. Um, so a very different example of post farm gate operation here. We've gone from family business to a, a shareholder business, we've just heard from Richard, to a really big business here. So John, love to hear from you. Someone get John's presentation up. 